Hey friends, welcome to Boca, a podcast exploring the ever blurring lines between the personal and business lives of professional photographers. This is your host, Nathan Holritz, and I'm happy that you can join me today in connecting with photographers and entrepreneurs as we discuss photography, business, and oh yeah, that sometimes messy thing that we call life. This podcast, it's brought to you by Photographer's Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. All right, Boca Podcast listeners, we are here for yet another episode, and um, I'm here with a new friend of mine, Jordan Caressis. How's Jordan, it going? thank you so much for making time to no do the problem. podcast today. Excited to be here. And we're actually at a cool place at Frothy Monkey. Uh, it's kind of a <laughs> funny name, but a coffee shop here in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area where I live. And this is kind of cool. I was chatting with Jordan a few minutes ago. This is the first time we've actually had the opportunity to meet in person, which is crazy because yeah. you're based here in Chattanooga. Exactly. Wedding photographer, correct? Wedding photographer, yes. Okay. And we're going to talk a little bit more about your business here in just a little bit as we, as we get going in the conversation. But we normally start off the podcast with something we call a technique for time. Yeah. And basically, I want our listeners, if they only have five minutes to listen to the podcast, to walk away with something of value. Cool. What we're talking about here is something that you might do in your day-to-day or week-to-week workflow that creates space for you. It gives you time to do something besides just work. Is there a particular thing that comes to mind? So something that... So I can work more or something that gives me more free time? And more free time, yeah. Because, you know, as, I mean, as photography business owners, and I shot weddings for over 10 years, I know it's easy to get really, really caught up in the day-to-day busyness. Exactly. There's so much to keep up with, it seems. And as a result, despite the fact that we started this business to have a little bit of freedom for ourselves, you know, we'd be our own bosses. It consumes us. It can <laughs> consume us. It really can. So, yeah, I'm curious if there's something that you do or you found that helps kind of make your workflow more efficient so that you're not working 80 hours a week and up all night, all hours of the night. Exactly. What's something like that? Yeah, I would say my biggest advice would be plan tomorrow today. Ah, and that's something okay. I, I live by I like literally that. religiously. We can and, make a t-shirt out of that. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. good. And so every single day after I'm done by work, I try to finish work by, by 7 o'clock. Okay. By 6.45, I'm already planning every single hour I'm going to do okay. um, for work when it comes to that day. And that way, I'm as productive as possible. And um, I can have some free time to kind of chill you know, after 7 o'clock and um, kind of ease ease down and everything yeah you know? yeah you need to be able to kind of wind down from the day i know that's exactly. it's, if you work until i know some people are and I've, I've been guilty of it too you work late into the evening mm-hmm. by the time it's time to go to bed you're still wired because exactly. there's so much going you on in your rest yeah everything about that too yeah yeah 100 yeah, percent. so but i like this idea of planning for tomorrow this is something that i've talked about on the podcast before uh, the notion of three MITs and coming up with those most important tasks. And I, I can't remember off the top of my head what, where, what book I read this idea in, but the idea of MITs, most important tasks, and ideally planning those. You get through your workflow and at the end of the day, planning for the next day, the most important tasks that you want to accomplish that following day. Exactly. That's good for the sake of efficiency because if we don't plan, it's easy to just kind of get be reactive, right? Anything that comes in, it's an email, it's a text message, it's a phone call, it's something that you happen to see on Facebook and you just kind of react to everything versus kind of proactively doing the things that are actually important to your business. Yeah. And that's so true because especially as, you know, f- first starting entrepreneurs and photographers just starting their business, what often happens, and th- I was guilty of this for starting out, you know, you wake up in the day and you're just like, what do I do? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you post on Instagram, right. you check your emails, check your website, but at the end, you don't feel like you got anything done. Well, let's be honest, like the, the quote posting to Instagram really turns into posting to Instagram and then surfing it. Scroll, yeah, <laughs> scrolling through the feeds and seeing who recently liked your posts. And yeah, you can, you can easily you get can carried get away in then. that. I, I like this idea of very, being very proactive. We talk about the notion of proactivity versus reactivity on the podcast a good bit. And I think it'll make a massive difference in all of our listeners' lives if they're willing to take just that small step, even if it's 10, 15, 20 minutes, how long do you take to, to plan for tomorrow? At the I would end say of the about day? 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. You look at those activities that you need to do that are going to push your business forward. Yeah. You write that out, plan out how many hours you think that's going to take, and you, you stick to it religiously as hard as you can. That's good. And that way, you know, by the end of the day, you write, all right, I got those 
tough tasks that move my business forward done. And by the end of the day, you're able to focus more on those tasks that are, you know, checking your email, maybe the editing. And those yes. are the stuff that don't, don't really push your business forward. Right. Um, but the stuff that you need to get done anyway. Yes, 100%. And that's where when, when we define or when I've defined proactive versus reactive tasks in the past, the, the reactive tasks are just that those things that have to be done for your business to exist, but they don't necessarily require your involvement. You could potentially delegate that elsewhere exactly, or outsource it. And they are not necessarily going to actually grow your business. Yeah. Right. I mean, the difference between something that you have to do that is going to make money versus something that you do that you need to do that may not actually increase your bottom line, but has to be done in order to make your clients happy. Exactly. A lot of people, a lot of entrepreneurs, they can be very busy, but they're really not productive in their business. Mm, yeah. And that's why it's, so important to focus on what I call PPAs, those profit-producing activities, ah. and make that the priority in your schedule that you plan beforehand. Okay. All right. PPAs. That's yeah. another... <laughs> we might have a whole different podcast episode for that one. That's good. All right. Well, let's keep moving because we got a lot of material to cover here. Speaking of that free time, so you've, this is a way that you create a little bit more freedom, flexibility for yourself, even... Cre- leave those evenings open for yourself and you said you're married as well right yes absolutely so is how do you like to spend your free time either on your own or with your wife yeah so especially during the free time usually sometimes it can be very much home body yeah <laughs> yeah like man why not be home and chill but yeah one thing that we especially like to do you know when we're not with friends or maybe we're not home or going out to eat or something like that just going to the places that really inspire us okay uh, we're both artists are both photographers okay and you know maybe that may be going to hike where some waterfalls are you know chattanooga is a beautiful place it's for that. stunning <laughs> yeah i mean i i have never truly appreciated as much as i have even just in the last i don't know maybe two or three years exactly. i've grown up a little bit personally but i've also been here since let's see i moved to chattanooga in 90 was it 95 maybe 95 so a lot's changed let's yeah. just say oh, within yeah. those it's 20 plus fast. years within these five years <laughs> oh yeah well it's it's grown it's grown but the number of places cool places just to go hang out now are great but then i also have learned to appreciate more the outdoors and chattanooga has so much to offer in that so regard true. it's absolutely amazing so that's really really good what's your wife's name by the way crystal crystal and she's a photographer as well yeah so she photographs weddings with me okay. about 50 percent of the time oftentimes i'm working just on my own on weddings and stuff and that's kind of how we got started even talking and everything was nice uh, photography back in college and yeah. stuff. you know okay very very cool well talk to me a little bit this is something a little bit of a different question that i've begun asking our guests How to be more present, more centered. I mean, you talk about the idea of getting outside and enjoying the outdoors. I I know personally, uh, one of the most enjoyable experiences that I've had actually with a camera, this was years ago. Um, I took, I have a medium format, a twin lens Yashica medium format camera. It's a six by six camera. Oh yeah, it's so much fun. One of my favorite cameras to shoot with. And I just set it up because everything is completely manual on it. Um, I'm setting it up on the tripod and I'm taking it out. And I went to, I think it was Suck Creek going up Signal Mountain. Yeah. Um, and, and for those of you listening, if you're not from Chattanooga, this is just one of the mountains in the area. It's a beautiful <laughs> road that goes up. Actually, I love to ride a motorcycle up it now. But I took the camera out there and just set it up and take a picture. And that, that whole process of setting the camera up on the tripod, taking your time, setting up that image, and then actually capturing the image, a manual process with a film camera like this was extremely meditative. Exactly. It encouraged that notion of presence. But how do you find centeredness or presence in your life and the busyness of being a photography business owner? That's a really good question, and I think it's something, especially entrepreneurs first starting out, we, we don't really pay attention to pay too much attention to. Yeah. And I would say for me, there's several things. Um, one of them is, I think, just physical exercise. Yeah. And sure. and that's been such a big thing for me because it, not only just for your body, but for mental toughness. Because yeah. business, running a business is hard. For you know? sure. For Especially sure. starting out. Things are going to go wrong. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Yeah. And you need that mental toughness mm-hmm. to push through. Mm-hmm. Mental clarity, too. I mean, it, I, yeah, I, I know so that true. working out for me brings a certain level of clarity. Exactly. Yeah. And it, especially when you started out first thing in the day, you're ready to get the work done that mm-hmm. you need to do mm-hmm. for your business. I would say the other thing would be prayer and even I've, this is one thing that I've just been starting to get into yeah. is meditation. Really? Okay. And a big part reason be, of that is because I'm a very naturally emotional and sensitive person. Okay. 
And in business, that can make things tough because in, in, yeah, instead of being logical, roller coaster of your exactly, emotions, right? you're reactive. Yes. You know, and just taking 10, 20 minutes to meditate, not think about a thing, mm. uh, not think about the emotions that are running in through my mind. Yeah. And the other thing would just be taking walks, kind of like that experience that you okay. had when you were, you know, taking pictures and stuff. Yeah. Uh, just having that kind of meditative experience, taking walks in really pretty places to kind of calm your mind yeah. and emotions and everything. Okay. Do you find, do you do that, those, those walks? Um, this is almost an aside, but I find this interesting when it comes to relationships, the significance of independence. Do you, do you take those walks with your wife or without or a combination of both? Mainly with my wife. Okay. Some, once in a while, um, I'm on my own and stuff as well. Okay. Because I know a lot, oftentimes like when I'm working on things in the business, I can sometimes feel very overwhelmed mm. thinking about the projects that need to get done. Yeah. And j- literally just a 10-minute walk makes you feel so good. Yeah. Well, you're stepping away from it all, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. It, it gives you a chance to hit the reset button, maybe have some conversation with your wife in this case about exactly. something not related to work. And when you take your mind off something, it, it allows you to come back maybe with a fresh perspective, which is great. You mentioned meditation, though. This is something we've touched on briefly in the podcast. I've experimented with it. I, I really enjoy it. I could do a better job more, being more consistent with it. But this meditation, I mean, the idea of meditation, I think, can be kind of overwhelming or disconcerting for some people. This, this idea that you sit down and, quote, not think about anything. Exactly. And I'm curious how you've approached it, what you've learned about it so far. That's a really good question. And I think, for me, the best approach when it comes to meditation is literally trying to think about nothing. Hmm. And because of how naturally emotionally wired and sensitive I am, when I first got started with this, um, I'm still new to, new to it. I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. You know? Well, and, and when, you, when you try to think about nothing, don't you tend to think about something? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And when you build that self-discipline just okay. in your mind, it really translates into the business when things go wrong, you know, when you have to problem solve hmm. a whole entire different situations. And that way, instead of reacting quickly, doing something that you're going to regret in your business, you can think it through logically. Okay. Yeah, there's there's a book that I've mentioned on the podcast before called Untethered Soul. Untethered Soul. Uh, it's by an author called Michael Singer. Okay. And he he lent a really interesting perspective to me about the idea of meditation, and more specifically about this idea of not thinking about anything. Yeah. Because again, it's it's um, you know I mean you, you you tell a kid not to stick their hand in the cookie jar, they naturally want to go stick their hand in the cookie jar. You tell somebody <laughs> not to think about you know fill in the blank. They naturally think about it. There's a tendency of, as human beings, I guess, to kind of be rebellious in a sense in that way, right? Exactly. So when we have this task in front of us, which is to not think about anything, there's, it's easy to begin to think about something. And it kind of defeats the purpose when it comes to meditation and, and quote, clearing our mind. So exactly. So the way that he described it, I thought was really interesting. And just to sum it up, he, was, he said to see, so we're naturally going to, we sit down, we close your eye, our eyes, we're potentially in a quiet environment. And these thoughts start to come to mind. Yeah. And what he talks about doing is actually seeing the thought in. So you see the thought, hmm. you acknowledge it. It's not that you're trying to shove it away. Because the moment you try to shove it away, it naturally just kind of glares at us, right? Exactly. So you see the thought in, and then you see it out. Mm. And so what I do is I actually picture this thought. It, it's there. Okay, fine. I acknowledge it. And I literally just kind of see it out the door. And that process, repeating that process, I've found in the past that it literally puts me into such a deep state of meditation yeah. that I feel like I'm waking up when that when the soft alarm goes off it, and I set it for you know whatever it is 10 or 20 minutes exactly I think that's amazing actually a really great visualization yeah because oftentimes you know when when that thought comes in you may get frustrated yes. like dang it yeah. you know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking again right, and right, right but that's an awesome visualization and well, the, the, one of the benefits of meditation is that it, it simulates sleep. Exactly. And, and part of, of course, the benefit of sleep is that it helps us organize our thoughts. And so it's interesting, I find anyway, when I go to meditate, it's an opportunity to kind of further this process that sleep hopefully is bringing me as well, which is exactly. organization of my thoughts. So naturally, when I sit in the quiet and close my eyes, thoughts come to mind. And this is an opportunity for me to acknowledge them, but then see them out. Give them some type of acknowledgement, maybe some significance, if you will. Exactly. But then to see them out, and it's that discipline of seeing them out, which then enables us, as you were talking about earlier, during a work day when we're, things are going crazy, not to let 
any incoming thoughts kind of take over. Exactly. We're able to, to see them out. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it's an interesting idea, and I just I was curious to get your your take on that and your perspective on it. I love that you're you're diving into it, yeah. and you've already found some some benefit from it e- as well. Exactly. And uh, I first started doing it because when I'd get into sales meetings yeah. uh, with potential clients, I had a, a a mentor who realized this in me. He's like, "You're very reactive." Okay. And he's like, "You need a." Calm your emotions down really? okay. a little bit. You should try meditation. Yeah. And that's when I actually started started doing that. And that way, exactly what you were saying, you know, when, when things come my way, I take just some time to think and control myself a little bit so I can make the right decision, say the right things. Yeah. Well, he and Michael Singer in the book also talks about the, the so-called voice inside our head, right? Yeah. And it's easy to engage with it. Learning how to disengage with it, I think it's really important. We give it so much significance at times that it gets in the way. And that part of the, the benefit of learning how to meditate is how to not give it the significance that we do yeah. so much of the time because it can be distracting from, from the task at hand. So That's so true. I'm going to put that, we'll, we'll put that uh, book in the show notes again. For those Perfect. of you listening in, out. yeah, please do. Um, Boca Podcast, B-O-K-E-H podcast.com. For those of you listening in, check out the show notes. Um, Haley does a great job putting together the show notes from these episodes. And I'm, we're going to have a lot of information probably today to, to share from this episode as well. Talk to me a little bit about an impactful book that you've read. Um, there are so many of them. Okay. I, really, I really can't think of just one specific sure. one. I would say, for when, when, when hearing that question, first things that come to my mind, my mind is, have you heard of One Thing? No. This, um, the book, the title is called yeah, One It's called One Thing. I forgot the okay. author's name. Okay. But I love that book because it really just, a lot of times, you know, as an entrepreneur, it's easy to just focus on too many things and yes. because of that you don't make progress right and this helped me just really focus on prioritizing one thing what's going to move the business for the furthest yes. the fastest yep. and just mastering that mm, and building good. that discipline in that okay we'll look that up and put that in the show notes as well perfect uh, i would say a couple others how to win friends and influence people 100%, of course 100%. Uh, the book influence um okay. and i love those books because to me marketing sales it's literally just psychology. Human psychology, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And another one, uh, this has nothing to do, even do with photography. A long time ago, um, my, my dad, I was like in elementary school, I okay. think. Okay. My dad introduced me to this book called uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yes. And uh, Great book. I read that Powerful book, book. And I think that's kind of what sparked, I don't even remember like much of it. It's been so long. Mm-hmm. But I know for a fact that's what sparked my interest in entrepreneurship um, later on in the years. It's really a, a, a way to frame finances or the management of exactly. finances and money ultimately, and just right? the possibilities like i was like yeah. oh you can do this right <laughs> yeah 100 <laughs> percent. that's really really great talk to us about your your photography business i mentioned earlier that you're a wedding photographer yes um and again here in the chattanooga area at least where you're based um you've got quite the following on instagram too and some, yes. some beautiful work by the way and for those of you listening in um check out jordan's work if you just go to j Core C O double R photography on Instagram. You can you can check out his work there. But talk to us briefly about how you got into photography and ultimately how long have you been been in business so far? Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, I actually got started, I believe, about seven years ago. And it it all started when well, when I was in college, I had no clue what I wanted to do. Okay, uh, I was like, should I be a nurse? <laughs> you know, okay, what should, well, what should I do? Yeah, and I ended up uh, deciding to be an, a missionary for a year. Really? Whereabouts? And, uh, I was in Peru and I was in uh, Bolivia. Okay. And I split the year between those two countries. Okay. And that's when I kind of learned, someone told me that there's a thing called like PR. I was like, PR? Okay, <laughs> I'll look into that. Okay. And just kind of through that journey, I found out more about like photography. I decided at that time, long story short, decided I was going to pursue photojournalism. Okay. I went to school to pursue photojournalism. And I ended up getting like my first wedding sometime through my years in college. And it just kind of built through that. Okay. Just trying to figure out that journey, thinking maybe I can do this. Maybe I can, you know, work for myself, build this wedding photography business. And did you, so you started photographing in college. Yes. And how quickly did that pick up? Um, I, I wouldn't say it picked up very quickly. Okay. Um, when, I, when I graduated college, I was like, great, I have this degree. <laughs> no one wants a photographer. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I ended up working as a janitor for about a year. No way, okay. And then 
f- trying to figure out my wedding photography business. So yeah. I was working as a janitor. Sometimes people would pass who, who knew me and I'd be incredibly embarrassed. <laughs> you know, like crap. They know I graduated college. This is whatever man I'm here too. cleaning yeah. toilets. And that, that's kind of where it started. A lot of trial and error, trying to figure out what strategies, what tactics work um, and trying to grow my business in the fastest way possible. Okay. And we're going to get into that some yeah, here. It's, it's actually a really great segue to our eventual conversation. But Talk to me a little bit, and, and by the way, for those of you listening, and forgive the uh, the background ambient noise, we are sitting at a really large coffee shop. In fact, <laughs> if you ever have the opportunity to visit Chattanooga, we're sitting in a very iconic landmark, the Chattanooga Choo Choo. They've now built the Frothy Monkey, this coffee shop, into the Chattanooga Choo Choo yeah, awesome building. It's, it's a really cool place. So I, I apologize for the uh, the yelling and clapping and chairs moving <laughs> and everything else going on in the background, but... Talk to us about your photography brand position. Um, I, I'm a former wedding photographer here in the Chattanooga cool. market. And since then, I have to say that the, the industry has just exploded. I mean, there were it, enough people it really in it at has. that point, but there are probably you know, just countless multipliers on that number now as far as the number of wedding photographers here. How do you actually set yourself apart? What is your brand position? That's, that's a really good question that I'm really passionate about as well. Because even just five years ago, I don't remember this many photographers. If you go on the knot, and you type in wedding photographer, you'll probably see about like a thousand vendors come sure. up. It's crazy. Yeah. And even now, more than ever, you can't just be a wedding photographer. You have to have what I call a niche within the niche. 100%. And it's that way, pe- brides can see that you have a specialty in a very specific niche. Yeah, if, if you say to somebody, I'm a wedding photographer, it's these great, days it's I pretty know, much like, 20 others. And? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say, for, for me... When it comes to finding my niche within a niche, um, especially since I'm really busy with, with a lot of students and stuff, uh, I try going more for the high-end weddings. And it doesn't necessarily mean a luxury wedding, but it, it means a high-end as in clients who are willing to pay more because they really care about it. Okay. And what is what is high-end in the Chattanooga market right now? I would say high-end usually ranges... At, it can. It's different for other people. I would say high-end would be considered between three to $6,000. As far as, yeah. as far as weddings and everything. And I would have to agree with that. And this is something I've, I believe I've mentioned on the podcast in the past. But if you look at the, the national statistics as far as where wedding photography is, how much people are spending for it, about, well, I guess it's about the top 5% right yeah. now are spending $4,000 and above. Yeah. And then the next 10% down are spending between 2 and 4 And exactly. then below that, you have the 75 to 80% of the market that are only spending two grand or less. Yeah, exactly. So so you are technically in the upper echelon there. Exactly. Um, and, and it's a really cool, kind of a cool area because not only do you get to you know work less weddings, but when you're sure. working with less clients, uh, you really get to make an amazing product and service for, for them, sure. which is yeah. really cool. And so um, I mainly go for very uh, more outdoorsy weddings. Okay. And one way, the biggest way that I make, make it so I can stick out in, in the crowded market is showing my expertise in posing. Okay. And that is usually the niche that I try to get. Finding that fear in couples who are really worried about being in front of the camera, giving a lot of value in the art of posing. So they come to me when it comes to that. Okay, now this is, this is uh, we have to park here for a second and talk yeah, about absolutely. this because I'm curious. And, and I'm, I just pulled up your Instagram account as you were talking. Posing these days isn't something that is as popular a subject, at least in, in some realms. Yeah. You talked about photojournalism earlier. Exactly. And Well, actually, I, I'll take that back. We went from the stage where, actually, when I started in wedding photography, when was it, back in 2001-ish, there was an opportunity to get into this so-called photojournalism, wedding photojournalism. Yeah. It was coming out of California at the time. Here in the Chattanooga area, it was definitely like stuffy posed wedding photography was kind of the norm and so we had an opportunity to kind of speaking of brand position position ourselves against the market and offer what we great in a cheesy way i I will say in hindsight now offer quote contemporary wedding photography okay but it it was essentially photojournalism we've seen over the years where photojournalism has continued to be popular but more and more there's been incorporated this sense of fashion exactly and and minimalism too i mean i'm even seeing like this one of the more recent posts on your your instagram account here there's a couple is this up on sunset rock that is actually um what's it called point park near near sunset rock okay so up on lookout mountain um again one of the mountains here in in chattanooga 
but there's a, a tendency toward minimalism. It's certainly a posed image, but a lot of negative space or white space, if you will. Exactly. And and so in this case, we need a little bit more posing. And, and I'd be curious for those of you listening in too. We we can uh, maybe we can even post this in the show notes. This particular pose. But talk to us a little bit about how you actually pose this image. Yeah, that's a really great question. And so, oftentimes, it's the very simple things okay. that can make a really beautiful pose for so for, so for this particular image yeah um one thing is one thing i ask the couple to always do is act as if there's a string on the back of their head pulling up and so this puts the spine in the right position uh, that's really flattering and that actually works exactly really interesting because exactly. if somebody said that to me i'd be like what what does that mean what is that <laughs> what does that look like or how does that feel so do you have to kind of walk them through that yeah i, I walk them through it okay. i do it with them make them really comfortable with that the next step is the shoulders bring the shoulders about an inch back okay and also making sure that the bottom of the spine the lumbar yeah. has a curve okay and now we're just right now we're just working on the basics and the foundation of making that pose really flattering for their body okay now the next step um it also comes down to their legs and so what i have michael doing is putting most of the weight on his back leg mm-hmm. and i and I, so oftentimes i have the bride cross one leg over the other okay and all this does is it raises one hip yes. higher than the other yeah. relaxing that pose yeah and it's those very simple things that the couple doesn't doesn't often think about and when you give a lot of value in whatever your specialty may be mm-hmm. um for, for me I, I try to work on posing and i'll have brides reach out to me and just said like oh i read your article like on on posing like really what okay. when's your what dates do you have available really and everything. exactly an article like in a blog or where we're um, so I, I do many articles on my Instagram, okay. uh, uh, the, the email list that I have of a bunch of brides, um, in a Facebook group where I have a bunch of brides and just always giving value, mainly on posing. Cause when I have a bride who is a little bit worried of how they're going to look in front of the camera, I want them to think of me. Okay. Interesting. Wow. I, I would never have thought that this was a thing that would actually draw clients yeah. in. So I find this <laughs> fascinating. When you, you talked about this posing, it seems kind of technical. How do you manage to kind of combine the technicality of that posing process while also maintain maintaining some type of intimacy where the people don't feel too kind of forced into a position and and maybe don't look quite as connected as they could yeah be. that's a really great question large part of that i believe is even just um the relationship that you build with the couple and when you build that relationship with the couple and everything they're able to kind of ease themselves into these more intimate poses you can do stuff with them that makes them bring these very in, um, authentic laughs okay and that's what you that's probably the most important part of the pose is just bringing authenticity yeah and I bet that some of that posing probably forces a little bit of laughter too because they're like I don't <laughs> quite know what he means or what am I doing exactly. here yeah exactly. okay that's interesting well cool I appreciate you sharing that nah, no problem and that's definitely a different perspective than I'm used to hearing these days I, I I mean, you hear of photographers that offer port posing courses or maybe do these demos at WPPI or otherwise, but yeah. it, I'm, I'm honestly surprised to hear of a younger photographer focusing on that. And I love that. It's something kind of different, though, exactly. and, and hopefully and, will set you apart. Yeah, and, and that's uh, that's one thing that I realized, because when I first got started, I I had no clue how to pose couples, okay. and I knew a lot of my, my colleagues who are also wedding photographers, yeah. they had no clue as well. And then when I realized that this was actually... A fear and something that a lot of even brides regretted, you know, when they realized they didn't like how they looked uh, in, in pictures and everything. I was like, that's a market right there. <laughs> that's, well, okay. So first of all, kudos to you for realizing that. And, and it's always important to look where the market is exactly. and go kind of the opposite direction. Right now it is very popular. I mean, certainly the, the fashion element of photography has been popular for a while. There's obviously posing innate to that. But then there's also a tendency, I still think, for a lot of wedding photographers to basically say, to their couples, and in some cases, literally, go stand over there and just talk to each other. Yeah. Go stand over there and look happy. Or go stand over there and whatever. And, and they just kind of leave leave it a chance <laughs> almost because these couples aren't used to being in front it's of true, the camera it's so normally. True. And a lot of times, I've, I've even worked with couples who, who had an engagement session beforehand that was like that. And they were like, they, they put us in an area and we're just like, what do we do now? Yeah, exactly. You know? But when you take full control yeah. of that and are able to make them comfortable okay. and give them value so they know that they're going to look good hmm. with these certain techniques that you use, it brings up confidence. And the most important thing, besides even just pretty pictures, they want to be in poses that are flattering for them, you know? Yeah, it's true. Man, okay, we may have to come back to this another time because <laughs> this, this is a pretty loaded topic too. 
Talk to us a little bit about the toughest lesson you've learned. You said you, you started in photography seven years ago. What's one of the toughest lessons that you've learned? Maybe for the sake of our listeners, they can avoid repeating a, a similar mistake. Yeah, this this is not going to... I don't think this will be um, one that you often hear a lot. Okay. But probably the toughest business lesson I, I learned through my journey was learning that to be successful in business, you literally have to become a different person. Hmm. And what I mean by that is, you know, I, I, I learned quickly. I, oh, I, I didn't learn quickly. Okay. <laughs> say. I learned through a lot of years of trial and error that it's not just about the tactics. I used to just be like, oh, what are the tactics? What are the tactics? And I'd learn all these tactics from mentors, books, programs. And I'm just, and then, you know, I didn't get results from it. Okay. And then I started to realize, you know, it's not just about the tactics. It's 50% tactics, 50% mindset. Hmm. And if, if you don't have the discipline in your yourself yeah. to bring those tactics to full potential, the tactics are crap. And so when I first got started in the business, I, w- I had a huge lack of discipline. Okay. Uh, I know I'd edit for a little bit, post pictures, oh, work's done. Right, right. <laughs> Watch Netflix, <laughs> check my email yep. once in a while. Yeah. And it, I was never able to get the wedding business on my dreams and work with the clients that I, I dreamed to until I totally changed who I am. Instead of being lack, having a lack of focus, I needed to become laser focused. Instead of having a lack of discipline and waiting for motivation, I had to build discipline no matter how I felt. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge, yeah, huge, huge one. It's huge, it's yeah. huge. And that's why meditation is huge as well. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't always feel like working, you don't always feel like doing these hard projects. Um, you know, oftentimes you just want to post on Instagram, put up a hashtag, and think you're done. Sure. But when you start going your business and you, you realize the opportunities you can get with certain tactics and realize it's so much harder to even get started with these tactics and build mm-hmm. these tactics, you realize how much work you need to put in and discipline you need to create in yourself. Oh, that's, so, your, that's good. And, and I, that was my biggest and toughest lesson because it took a long time for me to discipline myself. <laughs> sure. Well, so when you, you, earlier you talked about the idea that, that you can't necessarily just be... Did you say you can't just be yourself or that you have to kind of change who you, you suggested the idea that you have to change who you are? What you're actually talking about is not necessarily changing the person that you are as much as learning to develop a certain sense of discipline. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so just, just learning to be able to have those different disciplines, uh, take, do the things that aren't easy. Yeah. And when you know it's hard, tackle it anyways. Yeah. And that's what I mean by changing, that becoming a different person. Changing the mentality that you, like you talked about. That's, that's really good. And a good reminder for our listeners where did you find, I mean, were you, did you read a book or hear this from somebody else or just kind of learn by trial and error this, this principle? A little bit of everything. Okay. A little okay. bit of everything. You know, I'd, I'd read, bo- read books that taught me these things. I, I've, I've had different mentors kind of, kind of growing up to be able to point these things out in me. Um, I had my wife who's able to point these things out in me as cool. well. And just being able to ad- admit that these things are true yeah. in myself yeah. and actually take action yes. on that. Yeah. Well, it takes a certain level of humility where you have to set aside an ego, right, <laughs> exactly. in, in order to actually make change like that. And you mentioned your wife. Getting feedback from somebody that's close to you can, can be a little tough sometimes, exactly. but they can they also know you well enough, hopefully, to be able to give you that, that specific feedback. So Very that's true. cool that you're willing to take that. Uh, let's go a different direction here. Gear bag. Tell us something that's a favorite piece of gear in your yeah, gear bag these days. Absolutely, absolutely. So I'm actually pretty simple with my gear. Two cameras, 5D Mark III and a 60. Um, never even upgraded to the 62 Mark III because I, I thought it was fine. <laughs> Most you know? of this stuff is, is good just as it is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, when I first got started, um, I was shooting my first wedding with a T1i Rebel, you know? Yep. And it worked just fine. Exactly. And then 35 and 85. I used the 35 probably about um, Sigma Art 35 1.4, probably about 95% of the time, even okay. for portraits. Okay. Um, I love the look of it. Do you find that it's inhibitive to creating portraits i mean the fact the fact that it's a 35 means you have to get up a little bit closer right if you're going to get anything that's that's particularly intimate does that throw your clients off do they get nervous when you're standing that close to them i i always in the beginning of the session they get a little nervous in front of the camera but i think as the session goes on they don't even really think about it anymore a uh, beautiful thing about the 35 1.4 uh the sigma art lens is there's not a whole lot of distortion with it and it, even even though you're getting up close and it's a more of a wide shot it still looks absolutely gorgeous okay i do have other lenses i shoot with probably about five percent of the time you know 70 200 then you have macro lenses and stuff yeah but 35 and 85 are are my bread and butter right there okay how about you 
I, well, you know, these days, I mean, the, the 51 4 for me is kind of a, a go to if I'm going to yeah. pull a lens out. What else? Honestly, that's kind of my favorite lens in my, in my gear bag yeah, these days. Yeah, it's a great lens. But I don't even, because I'm not shooting actively anymore or full time anymore, um, I, I still say that my go to camera is that twin lens Yashica that I mentioned Which earlier. Lens? It's, it, no, this is a camera. So it's a twin, twin lens camera, the, the, um, the 6x6, the medium format camera. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's a twin lens setup, which means that one of the lenses is actually for viewing. And then that second lens is the one that's going to actually capture the shutters behind. It's going to actually really capture cool. the image. Yeah. So you're you're flipping up the, the viewing screen uh, on the top and looking straight down yeah. as you're holding the camera and then manually focusing it with this bellows style focusing system. It's a it's a really cool that's thing. Really but that's really cool. And the other one is a um, it's another camera actually. It's a it's a Russian panoramic camera. Russian panoramic. Yeah. It's called a, so cool. I believe it's called a Horizon. And it shoots 35 millimeter film, but it combines. So instead of uh, one frame that, that a 35 millimeter camera would normally take up, it takes up two frames. Yeah. And then you print it in. We used to print it in an eight by twenty format. Um, that so that kind of gives cool. you an idea of the the format. But yeah, it's that's a cool that's a cool <laughs> camera as well. Really it awesome. sounds like a toy when you take a picture of it. It's a swing lens camera. So when you you pop the shutter on it, the lens swings around like this. And uh, I, I know for those of you listening, you can't see me moving my hand here, but it's moving from, I want to say it's from left to right, where it swings from left to right and exposes that, that film gradually. That's awesome. Yeah, it's kind of Never cool. used a film camera like that before. That would be a lot, lot of fun. fun. Yeah, we may have to do, what we need to do is get together with the local photography group sometime and I'll bring our favorite stuff and then we can all go shoot with it. I think yeah. it'd be kind of cool. Usually, I, I, just for fun, I, I have you heard of the X100T? Yes, yeah. I, I shoot with that just for like family gatherings. Okay. And the iPhone ten's great. <laughs> it, you know, honestly, it really is, and that's almost a topic in and of itself. But you talk exactly. about gear and like the fact that we started with these uh, these kind of subpar. I'm, I'm in air quotes here, subpar cameras. But the reality is, even phones these days, can, <laughs> if, if you're smart with them, can take beautiful, beautiful images, so and, and you can blow them up large prints if you <laughs> yeah. want to. Yeah. Well, that could we could get lost in that topic, but let's let's jump on to kind of our primary topic for today, and, and that is that is this idea of generating new business. Now, it's not a new idea. Obviously, we all want to get new business. We want to book new clients. The question, of course, is how. And I know that you are kind of in the process right now of developing some educational material. Absolutely. Dealing with this particular topic that you were saying can help generate hundreds of leads a month. Um, that's naturally, I mean, I'm, you've got my <laughs> attention. Uh, that's naturally going to be uh, pique the interest of, of our listeners as well. So talk to us first about how you came up with this process. Absolutely. That's a really great question. So most photographers, they rely on what I call hope strategy. <laughs> if it's a strategy. Yeah, if it's a, if it's a strategy. And what, what that is, is um, they're on Instagram, they're posting, they're putting their hashtags, and they're hoping they'll get a lead or a client from that. And then there's the other one, they're you know paying $3,000 a month for an affiliate program like Wedding Wire. And they're hoping that they'll get a client from that. Usually it's price shoppers that run up from right often here. I was talking to this one really talented photographer as well. And she was telling me that you know she was promised 10 leads a month from Wedding Wire. Mm. Uh, but she ended up getting 10 leads in six months. Wow. And what's the going rate these days for Wedding Wire? Does it vary? Do I, I believe um, 1920 to $3,000 is what photographers are paying a year. Seriously. And most photographers from what I talk to hate it. I, well, <laughs> but they're yeah. scared to leave it yeah. is the thing. Interesting. Yeah. Why are they scared to leave it? They don't know what else to do. Ah, is is okay. really the thing. Okay. And, so, and it sounds like you're going to offer a great alternative now. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. And so what happens is... They're hoping for leads yeah. and clients, and they don't get it. And the other thing is word of mouth. Mm. And they're hoping that the people who they worked with are going to get them clients or get them leads. And it often just doesn't work out that way, especially as more photographers get into the industry. It's, it's a different world than it was five years now, yep. five years ago. Yep. And so I went through this. I did, I did all of this, and I was so frustrated. It is like, are we... like? Do all photographers just hope? You know, <laughs> do we just hope that our business is going to grow? Some some photographers get lucky, but for the most part, you know, I believe seventy percent seventy percent of photographers make less than ten k a year. And I was like, there has to be another way. And so, long story short, one a lot of trial and error, um, a lot of programs and mentors actually outside of the wedding photography industry. 
And I, I was able to learn these different methods through direct outreach methods, through Facebook ads, and then also through sales. And I was able to translate what I learned from all those things through the years for wedding photography and make it a rinse and repeat system okay. to get leads and get clients, basically. So this is something that obviously you've done for your business. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and roughly how many weddings are you shooting a year right now? So I used to shoot about... 20 when I was shooting more in the lower end. Okay. But now, especially since I do more education now, um, it's usually about 15, okay. usually around the 3800 to $4,000 range. That's really awesome. That we're working okay. for. So uh, I like that you've kind of developed this process through personal experience as Absolutely. opposed to just repeating something that you've heard somewhere else. <laughs> um, and, and I know that you talked to me or you shared this information ahead of time. The workflow is kind of broken up into, or this, this process, the method is broken up into three different parts lead generation, lead nurture, and then client conversion. Can yes. You, and and it, just to be clear, for those of you listening in, I mean, this is a really, really loaded topic. We only have so much time today to cover this on a, on a podcast episode. So we're going to link to further resources in the show notes. For those of you that are curious and want to tap into to some of this information that Jordan has to share with you. But let's let's cover the gist of it here today. Talk to us a little bit about these three steps that I just mentioned. What often happens is say when a photographer wants to try Facebook ads or maybe they're very much expecting to, all right, they put about a Facebook ad, they get a bunch of clicks, but they don't really get any leads or clients. So where did all those clicks go? Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. And we, need, we first need to understand the customer buying process. When a bride sees the ad, you know, they're not quite ready to buy yet. There still could be a 30 to 90 day span until that lead becomes from a cold lead into a hot lead. So what we first do is we first create a lead magnet, okay. a very compelling offer. And so that what, that's what your Facebook ad, or say for photographers who don't have a budget for Facebook ads yet, you can do it through direct outreach as well. And with that compelling offer and the right, right wording used in the ad, you can easily generate 100 to 300 leads a month. And then, so now we're just generating leads. Generating leads is just a start of the process. Right. Leads doesn't equal clients. And how are you actually capturing the, the information from those leads? Even? Yeah. And I know you can get into this in more detail in your actual courses, but it's, it's one thing to run an ad and, and somebody goes to that lead gen. Are you just capturing their email address at that point and it's funneling into a system? Yeah, so because we've had a really compelling offer, at this point the bride is actually really excited to follow our business okay so they get the lead magnet that we have in our ad and now we got them in our email series okay an automated email series where we can give them value in our niche within a niche okay um and then from that email series uh we also lead them to our instagram and facebook group okay you, so uh, instagram and f you said facebook group group Facebook. yes okay. not a page as as a photographer you're hosting a facebook group yes of your, I mean, should we call them fans <laughs> of, of your brand? I mean, is, is that the idea? Yeah, that's what we're turning them into. Okay, okay. We're turning them into fans. But it's not, it's not so much like Instagram where you're just posting pretty pictures. It's, it's more of an area where you want to be giving value. Hmm. And so we've generated these leads. They've agreed to follow our business. Yeah. And now we're nurturing them. We're giving okay. them value because when we want them to think about a photographer, we want them to think, I've learned a ton, to, a ton of stuff from, you know, from this photographer. And so we can we lead them to those different platforms in our nurturing phase. Okay. And different platforms. Can you give it a couple of examples? Of yeah. These? Well, the, the pl main platforms I use is the email series. Okay. And I'll get them in um, through my MailChimp. I use MailChimp. Okay. And then a Facebook group. Facebook groups are really powerful because you get a lot of views. Okay. Unlike a Facebook page where you need to boost your post yeah, yeah. Uh, to get views, with yeah. a Facebook group, sometimes 50% of the people in that group see it, unlike maybe 5 to 10% that wow. you get in Facebook page. That's huge. Exactly. Okay. And then also, of course, our Instagram. And that's even more of a place where we may not have to rely so much on giving all these articles and value, but we can actually just showcase our work a little bit more. Okay. And so now, instead of hoping we're going to get a lead through our hope strategy, we have a predictable way that generates leads and actually opts the bride in to excitedly follow our business. And then you have the opportunity at that point to convert them. Exactly. Now, I have to play a little devil's advocate here because I'm curious. A bride is, I mean, they have their own lives to live, their own yeah. interests and, and 
time that they want to spend with friends and family and their own interests on Facebook or Netflix, for that matter. You mentioned Netflix earlier. How do you create enough interest in these Facebook groups to actually make them want to spend time there, even a little bit of time there? I mean, you talked about doing something that's generating value for them. Exactly. What kind of things would you do that would actually draw Brian in to spend time in these Facebook groups? Really great question. And the mistake you don't want to make with a Facebook group is just, oh, look at my pretty pictures. You know, you'll get a lot of rides starting to leave that group. But think about what places like The Knot post. That's become a source where brides look out and they're looking for value when it comes to wedding planning, maybe when it comes to posing, planning their engagement session. If you're able to get them into a Facebook group and automatically be that source, not just in your Facebook group, but your email series, and be that source where you're actually posting articles that they are interested in, then it it raises in their mind that, you're the photographer that they can trust. So it's building trust at that point. Interesting. Okay. Maybe it's a bit naive of me. I mean, this this was not the way that our industry functioned however long it's been ago now, six, seven years ago <laughs> yeah, when I was exactly. shooting. But it, it, the idea that you're creating the same content, ideally better, more focused, more specialized, that somebody like The Knot might be creating so exactly. that they don't have to go there. They're coming to you for that information. That's that's really inter- interesting. It's very compelling. And then talk to us just briefly about the conversion process at that point. I mean, you're, you you brought them into this funnel, if you will. Exactly. Again, not something that you traditionally think about with a photographer. <laughs> you don't. The sales funnel. But you brought them into the funnel. You're nurturing them by giving them valuable content that's relevant to this process of planning for a wedding. And now you want to convert them. I mean, do you have a particular methodology that you can at least summarize here when it comes to conversion? Yeah, absolutely. And so now, yeah, exactly what you said. We have this system where we know how many leads we're going to get. And we basically know how many leads we're going to get from like $100 can easily get you about 100 leads in 10 days. Okay. Uh, and so we, we've built up these leads. Sometimes some of my students, they use direct outreach. And I've had students build up to sometimes 200 to 300 leads just through direct outreach with the right message. Direct outreach meaning like DMing or what, what do you mean? By direct? DMing, straight, really? up, straight okay. up DMing. Wow. And that's, and that's a lot of times we're waiting for the leads to come to us. We need to t- totally turn that around. Okay. And usually when it comes to direct outreach, it's a very similar message we use in the Facebook ad. Very non-salesy, very conversational. Okay. And it's such a compelling offer. Where they're like, yeah, sure. I'd like that. <laughs> wow. Okay. Exactly. So after we've nurtured these leads, I, I, I use about 90% of our content should be nurturing content. And 10%, I say, call to actions. Hmm. And so we'll have call to actions that have scarcity, that have authority. And sometimes you're mentioning that you don't have very many dates. That you're not accepting very many couples. Mm-hmm. And then reach out to see if your date's available. And the thing that you want to do is... And are you creating those, those call to actions within the Facebook group? Within the group, within Instagram, the email. email series, okay. um, all of those. Okay. okay. And so the biggest part is, is getting them into a meeting without them quite knowing your prices yet. Especially if you're in the more, you know, high ticket range where you're charging three to six thousand dollars, you don't want to show your prices yet. <laughs> no? I mean so again to play devil's advocate, would yeah. you not want to kind of filter to make sure that you're bringing the right clients in for the meeting and not waste your time? I believe that with the the sales oh I know with the sales method that I use, it can very easily convert price shoppers into value shoppers. Interesting. Okay. And so for me, um, sales is one of my passions. Okay. And I used to absolutely suck at it. <laughs> suck okay. at it. Okay. And a lot of times, you know, we get into these meetings w- with couples. We're always changing up the things that we say mm. without really knowing if it was effective or not effective. And so what I do, I, ca- I call it my master wedding sales script. And I'm able to convert a high ticket wedding client, often in their $4,000 range, um, within 24 hours. Wow. And so you're never playing the waiting game about... Are they going to book me? <laughs> you so know? You're setting that hope game aside again, like exactly. we were talking about earlier. Exactly. Okay. And so if they don't book me within 24 to 72 hours, I know they're not going to reach out. But most of the time, I'm able to get the clients to book within 24 hours. Wow. And so one thing that's really important to mention, you're like, Jordan, you, you mentioned 100 to 300 leads. What happens to all of those? Um, you know? And you, one, you need to, those are cold leads. Sure. And so it's a process where we're getting a bunch of cold leads, a bunch of brides to find out about your business. We're nurturing the qualified leads, the ones who really like your niche within a niche. Mm-hmm. And then when we're able to get them, make the, do those calls to actions to get them in a meeting, you take control of the meeting, 
do the sales script, and if they're qualified and they're the right client, you can close them within 24 hours. Wow. And so what percentage of those cold leads turn into warm or qualified leads, would you say? That's a good question. And it really depends on one year price. Okay. And so I would say spending $100, I maybe get 100 to 200 leads, and I'll normally get one to two clients from those. Okay. So usually $100 can make me 3600 to $4,200. Not, not a bad ROI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's a good deal. Well, this is pretty compelling stuff. And what I'd like to do, uh, I mean, certainly I would like for you to share again where our listeners can find you online on social media and your website, but then we can make sure to link to the further educational resources that yeah, you're offering now in our absolutely. show notes as well. Yeah, so uh, you can actually find me on my Instagram at J-C-O-R-R Photography. Yeah. Um, I actually do have a free training okay, where cool. I go much more in depth. Awesome. Yeah, because it's it's tough to cover. This is such an in-depth <laughs> it's topic, in depth topic. And, and a lot of different perspectives on it, too. So I, that's really great. Where, where can we find that? Yeah, so um, you can ask me for the link on okay. my Instagram, sure. or you could type in bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y slash wedding lead machine okay and so through that wedding lead machine uh through that site you can reserve uh for the your spot for the free training and yeah it's a 90 minute in-depth training where we talk about going deeper in your niche okay we talk about the myths that we're going to grow your business slowly and we're going to talk about how to build that system in your business as well okay very good so we'll link to that in the show notes as well Haley will put that there um, your Instagram and Facebook is it also J Core Photography? Yeah, J Core Photography. And then the website as well is www.jcorephotography.com. Perfect, man. Thank you so much for making time. Yeah, no it, problem. Kind of out of the fun. blue. I know. I I speaking of DM, <laughs> I DM'd you <laughs> exactly and said, "Hey, can we do a podcast?" And you're more than gracious to to come down here and do this. Thanks for making time for the book podcast. No problem. This was a lot of fun. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much for listening to the Boca podcast today. Will you let us know what you think by leaving a review of the podcast in iTunes or maybe in the Apple podcast app? And I'd love to hear from you personally with your thoughts about the podcast, maybe suggestions about future topics and guests for the show. My direct email is nathan at photographersedit.com. The Boca podcast is brought to you by Photographers Edit, custom image editing for the wedding and portrait photographer. Just visit photographersedit.com. Dot com.